Hi, Brian. It's lovely to be here in the backyard, mm -hmm. Hopkinton, of your parents' home. That's Is correct. That right? Yep. Yes. And um, it's summertime. I, as a teacher in Hopkinton, I understand you're uh, on vacation now mm -hmm. uh, for the summer in a way of school work mm -hmm. anyway. And um, what I've read about you as a teacher in town um, is you have been described uh, by some students as engaging in your approach. And I understand that uh, you are admired by students in this town for your approach. And I'm wondering if you could uh, show us a little bit of how of that uh, engaging approach, maybe by t starting off with a story, telling us a story. Yeah. So. Uh, I do appreciate it. Thank you for having me uh, on here. I really appreciate it. Um, I love this community, so uh, any way that I can kind of connect more with the community, I always appreciate. Uh, so I started uh, as a teacher in Hockington. It's now coming up on seven years ago, which, which seems pretty wild. Um, and I think that I've been able to have a unique connection with a lot of the students because I graduated from Hockington in 2008. That allows me the opportunity to share in the experiences of being a Hopkinton High School student, the pressures, the stresses, and all that. Yeah. Uh, so before I was teaching in Hopkinton, um, I did my student teaching at Springfield, uh, mm -hmm. at a middle school, Van Sickle Middle School in Springfield. And while I was there, that's when I kind of like learned the ropes, so to speak. Uh, but even before that, uh, an interesting story uh, about where I came from as a, as a student at UMass Amherst mm -hmm. was I started off as a civil engineering major. And I thought coming out of Hopkinton that I just needed to go and get a job that it's going to make me a lot of money because that's how I determined my self worth. Mm -hmm. um, but then I felt I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know if engineering is for me. Uh, and then through a course of events, I ended up changing my major to history. Mm -hmm. Well, when I applied for the student teaching program at UMass, we had to sit in these group interviews with other potential students uh, to apply or interview for a high school position to be a student teacher. And that was a story I told that I came on this roundabout way into teaching and I didn't know I wanted to be a teacher and then I became a teacher. And what was interesting is in my group there was a, a person at the end of my group who said the complete opposite. He had a long line of teachers in his family, his father, his mother, his grandparents, his aunts and uncles, they were all teachers. He knew from that as early as he could remember that he wanted to be a teacher. And it was funny because later on, the two of us met up and we were both intimidated by each other's. Uh. He's like, oh, you didn't know you wanted to be a teacher and now you are. And it's like, that's so cool. And I'm like, you always were gonna be a teacher. I'm like, how can I compete with that? What was funny is later on, we both ended up being student teachers and we traded information to connect and we had to shadow each other. And so he's like, hey, you should come over to my apartment. I was like, great, where do you live? We lived in the same apartment complex wow. in Amherst. Wow, so I went over to his apartment complex and I go inside and I look over his TV and there's a big picture of his intramural soccer team. And I said, why is there a picture of my sister, Samantha, on your wall? And he's like, oh, that was a free agent we picked up and she won us the championship. She kicked the game winning <laughs> goal for the championship. I was like, that's my sister, wow. Samantha. So then I knew that it was, it was destiny. So that was just a, a funny story. <laughs> You know, kind of about how you meet up with someone in one moment of your life, and then you realize, like later on, there's that that That's really strong right. connection. So, wow. yeah, I like I like telling that story. I know, you know, my fiance has heard that story 800 times and, uh -huh. and hates hearing it, but yeah. <laughs> and your sister, uh -huh. she loves it because she's kind of the star of it, and she won the sure, game for them. Yeah. yeah. Well, that is indeed a mm -hmm. great story, and uh, and connects uh, to us moving forward with this uh, interview to learn more about you. Yeah. Uh, as, a, as a resident of Hopkinton and beyond in the world, right. uh, which uh, is part of your story. Um, could you begin and tell a little bit about your early roots uh, in the town? You said you grew up mm -hmm. here, right here, in, yep. in this house. Yeah, grew up here. Uh, um, so my parents, I think, uh, as you may know and others may know, my parents and grandparents and so on, they've been in Hopkinton forever. Uh, so here we are at the house I grew up in. My dad's mother grew up right next door, you know, so I was, I was always close to uh, his side of the family and then my mom's family, they were all scattered within 10 minutes of here. So I, I grew up with a very close-knit community. Uh, my friends were my cousins growing up and we were all separated by a few years in high school. So going through Hopkinton, we lived a very uh, close-knit life. Couldn't get away with anything. Everybody was always watching you all the time, which was, you know, a blessing and a curse. <laughs> 
But then after uh, Hopkinton High School, I went to UMass Amherst, mm -hmm. and as I said, I wanted to be an engineer. And in that time at UMass, I was really given the opportunity, um, thanks to my parents, to travel a bit. Uh, so my first summer after freshman year of college, I went to Honduras. Uh, I did wow. mission work with St. John the Evangelist uh, Catholic Church. Uh -huh. right we went here down, in town. yeah, right here in town. Uh, I went down to Honduras, mm -hmm. and we did uh, just some work just for a week, mm -hmm. and it. In with the grand the scheme, community? for the local community, in the grand scheme, we weren't doing a ton mm -hmm. to help, but it was really impactful for us mm -hmm. uh, to see you know, people who live a different style of life and for me to really open my eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people inside Hopkinton, because it's such a safe and protective community, it, mm -hmm. you can really be limited right. on the scope of your experiences. Uh -huh. So going to a developing country mm -hmm. in Central America, I really got to experience uh, something that I wouldn't have here, and mm -hmm. that helped to open my eyes. Mm -hmm. A few weeks later, after I came home, uh, I went with my cousin uh, Ben Aiken, and we traveled for two and a half weeks to Thailand. Oh, uh, boy! And How so old were you then? I was nineteen. Uh, so I was nineteen. Uh, he was eighteen, uh -huh. and uh, that was also a phenomenal experience. That yeah. was for your own. Uh, Just for my own. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. So he, we had some family uh, friends who had moved to Thailand, mm -hmm. and we went to visit them. Mm -hmm. And just the culture could not be more different. You know, very slow paced, appreciating their existence, whereas we are very fast paced, go, 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 and you know, always trying to move around. Mm -hmm. uh, and there we ate different foods, we saw different people, there was a completely different language. And I remember I had a moment that really impacted me in the Bangkok airport mm -hmm. when we were leaving. The whole time I was there, I was with my cousin and our friend, and all of us are white. And when I was in the Bangkok airport, I went to the food court. And I remember my cousin, he was staying with the bags. We were waiting for our plane. I went down to the food court, ordering some food, and I sat down and I looked around. I was the only white person in the whole area. Mm -hmm. Growing up in Hopkinton, that had never not been the case. Mm -hmm. And that was such a transformative moment for me. In that very, very split, small second of time, I was like, oh, this is what it's like to, to be different. Mm -hmm. And I had never felt that before, and I'd never, knew what it could be like for a person maybe who lived in Hopkinton who didn't have some of the shared cultural or you know normal experiences normal I was like ah oh, this is very interesting you know I am an outsider here mm -hmm. I didn't feel unwanted I didn't feel you know that I was treated differently but I just I understood that, that I was, kind it was of larger awareness exactly mm -hmm. and so then I come home and you start, you could look at the world a little bit differently yeah. you know and I, I really I appreciated that well then fast forward two years I went abroad uh, for five months to Italy, and even though it's not a completely different culture, the Italian culture is slightly different. You know, they're, they have their own ways of doing things, and I learned a little bit of Italian, and I got to appreciate looking at the United States from a European perspective, you know, and that was very interesting for me, mm -hmm. seeing all the experiences happening in the United States from abroad, you right. know, and I really enjoyed that, and then I came home. And that's when I decided to change my major from engineering to history. And wow. I felt like I just spent five months studying Renaissance history mm -hmm. at the heart of the Renaissance. I, I couldn't want to do anything else. Mm -hmm. So came home, changed my major, told my parents, and they were very supportive of it. And so I really think that traveling around the world has been monumental in mm -hmm. uh, my formation as a, an adult and a thinker. Mm -hmm. And it, if it hadn't just happened like that, you know. Right. Who knows, but yeah. uh, it's really interesting how that changed your, your path. Absolutely. You know, and each something you're so passionate right. about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was great. Oh, wow. And um, so then uh, you finished, you got your uh, degree in history. Mm -hmm and went on and just started teaching right away over in Springfield? Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. actually a similar experience. Is I, I had the opportunity to teach at a rural high school out in Western Mass yeah. or at an urban high mm -hmm. school in Springfield. And right. I chose the urban setting because, again, I felt like that was very different than growing up in Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. you know, Springfield mm -hmm. Mass is very different than Hopkinton Mass. Mm -hmm. Many socioeconomic issues, cultural differences, and I was teaching middle school, which already is a challenge. Mm -hmm. I've never taught before. Sure. I'm teaching eighth graders. And I was teaching um, a population that had, it was 10% white, it's 40% African American, and then 40% uh, Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And so I was totally out of my element, yeah. which reflecting upon mm -hmm. was the best thing that could have uh -huh. ever happened to uh -huh. me. You know, if I had been put into a situation that was similar to Hopkinton, I don't think I would have grown as much, right. you know, but I have kids 
coming to me with problems that I never could have imagined. Hey, uh, could I just stay after? Could I get a detention today? Because I don't want to walk home just yet. I don't feel safe. Or, you know, kids who experience problems at home that I never would have imagined. And it really gave me an appreciation for growing up in Hopkinton yeah. and also the value of public education. Yeah. You know, if mm -hmm. there are so many students out there that might not have good role models. They might not have stability, mm -hmm. but a public education, a good school system can provide that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've, I've tried to carry that into Hopkinton because, you know, even though it's a beautiful affluent community, you never know what student is looking for stability or looking for a good role model. Right. You know, right. even if, you know, our median income may be higher, that doesn't always tell the full story. And mm -hmm. so I've, I've really tried to take those lessons uh, to heart. Mm -hmm. And the best lesson that I ever got, my mentor told me, she said, if you get offended by something a 13 year old says to you, you're in the wrong job. And so I've, I've really tried to hold <laughs> oh, on to that, advice. you know, yes, is for... not to take things too seriously. Yeah. Understand that, you know, students come in every day with a whole host of, sure. you know, hormonal, emotional problems mm -hmm. and you just have to be mm -hmm. uh, the bedrock for them. Mm -hmm to grow well, and learn. That's a great way of looking at that and, and saying that to others mm -hmm. also. And, uh, and what you're talking about from your path, it's not only about understanding uh, places outside of ourselves, but that there's individual variation mm -hmm. everywhere too. And uh, so important observations right. you've had early in your life from your experiences mm -hmm. that can be uh, transmitted and be of benefit to others out there. So uh, I say, uh, thank goodness you well. are a teacher and the uh, good work you're doing. So can you tell a little bit about uh, coming then to Hopkinton sure. and, and what you're teaching now? Yeah, and I think um, I am definitely not alone in uh, the level of passion and commitment uh, and understanding of my colleagues, mm -hmm. and my coworkers. Mm -hmm. I think they all share uh, my idea that the kids are always growing and they're always changing and we're there to, to nurture and to guide them. And I think that's ubiquitous across Hopkinton High School. So I definitely could not have landed in a better school system no, without question. It's definitely the best place. What do you think keeps that going, uh, you know, besides being supported with resources and uh, an affluent Yeah, I think, community? so part of it is that, right? Yeah. Whenever I want, whenever I want to experiment with some new topic, or we want to go on a trip or something like that, the school can provide that, which is good. But it's, I think it's more than that. I think it starts with uh, the community at home. The kids say thank you to me at the end of every class. You know, that's not something I tell them to do. That comes from something at home. That's external. And so I, you ha and this is what I say on parent night that I really do appreciate the families in this community who raise kids who are empathetic and compassionate mm -hmm. because I I can't teach them how to be compassionate mm -hmm. for one hour a day mm -hmm. for nine months, mm -hmm. right? That's something that is intrinsic to them that they've learned throughout their lives. But at the same time, my colleagues, we all are trying to do, we're always trying to be on the, the cutting edge of mm -hmm. what is new in education and, you know, trying to find ways to reach students in, in the best possible, the best possible manner, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think being surrounded by good colleagues and having a good community is great. And then I, I am going to compliment Evan Bishop, the mm -hmm. principal, mm -hmm. and our administrative staff, Josh Hannon and Justin Palmerville and others. They have leadership. really yeah. phenomenal leadership. Mm -hmm. They've been so steady. They've been the administration uh, for as long as I've been uh, here at Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. And just uh, kind of their steadfast resolve for, towards keeping the ship moving forward, mm -hmm. trying to bring everybody along with us, mm -hmm. understanding that it's not about the numbers, it's not about rankings, it's not about data, it's about understanding that everybody matters in the school system. Wow. And when it's set from the top, that's all I've ever known. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why would I think differently? Mm -hmm. And I think that's Terrific. probably the best. Oh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. very encouraging to mm -hmm. hear. Um, so, and you've been in Hopkinton teaching how long? So this is coming up on my seventh year. Seventh yeah, year. Yeah, so six full years. All right. Wow, and so what are you teaching? What's going on f with you? Over so there? I, the entire time I've been at Hopkinton, I've mm -hmm. been a world history teacher, mm -hmm. a modern world history. Mm -hmm. So we start uh, right around the French Revolution, mm -hmm. and we come all the way up to the present day. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually end the year talking about future issues, mm -hmm. kind of wow. the rising population, uh, changing of the climate, talking about all sorts of different issues that are down the road, mm -hmm. because these students are 15, and they're going to have to deal with problems much bigger than we could probably even imagine. Mm -hmm. Automation of jobs, migration of people, and mm -hmm. that's what I really 
get excited about mm, is yeah, sure. you give kids the history of the world so far yeah. and now here's what we think is going to happen right. you go and deal with it absolutely mm -hmm. and yeah. i think that's really cool but i also teach a course on human geography uh, which is similar to that it's mm -hmm. a course specializing in all these different trends and changes that we're seeing in the world today from you know why do some countries play soccer versus mm -hmm. baseball and you know why are some countries authoritarian and mm -hmm. you know languages mm -hmm. the spreading of people and you know research it's just it's so fascinating yes yeah. uh -huh. it really is and this is your first time it's the first this? time uh, teaching that mm -hmm. and again the administration was mm -hmm. uh, so generous and supportive to allow me to start to teach that yeah, which yeah. I appreciate oh that that sounds exciting mm -hmm. for the students oh. Yeah, can adults sit in your class? Yeah, right, right. Coming? Yeah, I think so. I think they would get a little bit uh, overwhelmed. Uh -huh. There's a lot, as you yeah, said, it's sure. a lot of energy. You yeah. have a bunch of 15-year-olds, and yeah. then I have the immaturity of a 15-year-old, and so uh, it's yeah. it's chaos, <laughs> more or less. But they say thank you to you. They do, yeah. I'm I guess still processing that. I think they, That yeah. is quite amazing, right. I think. I think they're um, learning uh -huh. something. Uh-huh. Well, um... Yeah, I'm curious, I have a few more questions. Mm -hmm. um, are there any mentors that come to mind in, in all you have achieved mm -hmm. uh, in your work, in your life so far, that you give credit to for the wisdom you carry? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. my parents would be first and foremost yeah. because they provided uh, me and my sister with the stability mm -hmm. to, to grow and to challenge ourselves and to take risks. Mm -hmm. If I didn't have supportive parents, then I wouldn't have been able to travel um, I wouldn't have been able to maybe change majors my senior year. You know, I lived at home for the first few years while I was teaching. Not every person has that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I've been remarkably privileged as a, you know, a member of Hopkinton to have that. So my parents first and foremost, but then uh, Deanna Law was my fifth grade teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and then she's taught fourth grade. She's at the Hopkins School and just a staple uh, in the education community. And I know that there's many students that I've had who also had her mm -hmm. and they everyone mm -hmm. speaks so highly of mm -hmm. her and she's just she was the first teacher that I really felt and one of the only teachers that I felt encouraged us to be ourselves and to take risks and to do things not because it meant anything on a test but just to be yourself and to learn who you are at a transformative age so she was easily the most uh, profound impact on me mm -hmm. growing up and then once I got to the high school uh, Michael Sullivan mm -hmm. was my psychology teacher mm -hmm. And he's now one of my uh, close mentors as a new young teacher. Mm -hmm. He's our department head. And I think his guidance as a teacher for me was really helpful. And then it just carried right over as a new teacher. Wow. Um, uh -huh. He's one of the best teachers that, yes. I've, that I've ever known. Uh -huh. And he just has a, a wonderful appreciation for learning and for public education. Mm -hmm. And so again, that's all I've ever known. Yes. And so yeah. I'm just gonna continue to carry on uh, that that's, approach. That's hopefully. terrific. Yes, I'm familiar with both of those. The They're last wonderful. Two mentors, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that I agree with you. And um, oh, we're running out of time already. I have so many questions, but Sorry. I did want to talk to you um, about what you do in your spare time. Sure. It, it sounds you're so committed to teaching. Um, um, are, are there any uh, talents or hobbies that you enjoy? Or? Yeah. So I think one that's interesting is. Uh, as a teacher, and I got a lot of energetic kids, I keep three juggling balls on the front of my desk. Uh -huh. which doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, has no uh, application to the curriculum, but sometimes the kids come in, they're a little bit you know, crazy, and they need a moment to just step back from yeah. the curriculum. And so I have these you know, almost as little fidget tools, uh -huh. try to teach them how to juggle, mm -hmm. uh, and it's just a fun way to connect with the students and then give them something to do. And I had a student recently who uh, he didn't know how to juggle. Mm -hmm. uh, his name is Jack Fortuny. He didn't know how to juggle. Mm -hmm. A week later, knows how to juggle, and you can juggle on wow. the legs. And it was very impressive. So uh -huh. I try to yeah. impart that upon the students, and uh -huh. you know, usually take 15 minutes and how teach kids think, how to juggle. You know, mm -hmm. in, in high school, that's a, an offering. And, yeah. And how it can feed into the whole experience. Well, right. could you give a, us a demonstration? I think I could. Yeah, yeah. I think I could try. All right. It. Well, why don't we uh, go give a try over there? Sure. Okay, so I do, I try to teach my students every now and then when they're a little bit hyperactive how to juggle. It's a mm. thing that I, I have in my classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, so I like to start with a progression. As all yeah. things, we have progressions in track and field and the teaching. Uh, so we start with one, uh, and I like to have it in one hand and then just at about eye level, just throw it 
to the other hand. Mm -hmm. And then back, and then back. And again, like I said, we're trying to work on those neural pathways, trying to connect those parts mm -hmm. of your brain that you don't often use, throwing the ball back and forth, over and over. Once you can do this pretty consistently, right? Yeah. Then we add in a second ball, uh -huh. right? So <laughs> this, this is where it gets a little bit trickier. Uh -huh. So I like to start with, you know, throwing one ball up in the air at about okay. eye level. Mm -hmm. And the second ball I'm trying to throw underneath that arc. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't make mm -hmm. a lot of sense, but once you yeah. do it, it kind of does. So up and then under, uh -huh. up and then under. And then you start with the other hand, up and then under, up and then under, up and then under. Yeah, that's going pretty well. The hard part is <laughs> then you kind of have to alternate. Oh, up and then under okay. and that is where a lot of people kind of get tripped up and yeah, that's actually sure. probably the hardest part uh -huh. is figuring out this because mm -hmm. once you have three it does I know it's weird to say but it kind of just like makes sense once you have three mm -hmm. but that's the hard part so then once you mm -hmm. get three you know it's kind of up and under over and over and over again so wow. you go one two three uh -huh. one two three and then you try that a bunch of times and then it eventually just kind of Amazing. It just kind of works. Yeah, you see it on TV or somewhere. Yeah. And now I can't do anything more than perfect. that. There's people who can juggle <laughs> chainsaws and they can juggle behind the back and <laughs> the legs and all that. But uh -huh. you know, this? I, this is just a simple little mm -hmm. trick that I, keeps their attention sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm walking around, I'll juggle the balls and everyone's looking at me. Sure. So, yes. Want to so, try? Yes. All right. I, so I let's start try. with one. All right. Um, and then just about eye level. Okay. All right. Keep that here. Keep it down here. Right about yes. here. Uh huh. Up and then down. Up. Back and forth. Oh, already this feels very difficult. <laughs> it's okay. It does take a lot of practice. Most people yes. can't learn it fully in a day, but you can try. Okay. There ha it has happened, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So the next part is you take this and we're going to start with this, throw this up about here, uh -huh. and then this one you're going to throw underneath that arc, which is tough. And if okay. you make it, great. If you don't make it, All that's right. totally fine. I'll give it a try. Yeah. Oh my, there you go. You there think? you go. Yeah, yeah almost. You got them both. You got them both. All right. Try, Try again. again. Try again. Hmm. Oh, Perfect. Oh, oh, I did Look it. At that. That's it. And then <laughs> so from success. there, we would add three, and you just. <laughs> yeah, it's we're not all about. That. <laughs> it's all about repetition. You know, uh -huh. as with most things, you're just trying to like do the same thing over and over and over again until yeah. your brain kind of figures it out. With, so. a, with a lot of practice. Yeah, with a lot of practice yeah. mm -hmm. and being a hyperactive teenager, mm -hmm. it helps. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I will keep that in mind for, you know, maybe something, some something to show people day, later on. Right? That's right. <laughs> thank you. So thank you for giving the demonstration yeah, no and worries. teaching me. You are a great teacher. <laughs> and I see I have a lot to learn in, the, in that area. but I Okay, can, it just takes practice. Yeah, I can see how this could be a very valuable uh, offering in addition to the in intensity that mm -hmm. you're teaching on history and culture and mm -hmm. the world and the future. Um, and, um, and that is so important um, to, to, to be engaging in that way yeah. with your students uh, at the age of 15 or so. So, um, and, and, in, and talking about the future and application uh, of what you do and, and what you have learned in, in the world, you know, um, as, a, as a teacher and a, a mentor uh, to others, um, what could you um, say, could you talk about is your wish for our future generations mm -hmm. um, and, and all you've learned and all you teach? Sure. So one thing that, one of the first messages that I used to hear a lot when I started teaching as a young teacher was other people, older people thinking about the kids these days, they're brats, they, they don't work hard, they, they must be so annoying and frustrating. And I never found that to be the case. I actually found it to be the opposite. And when I actually would get frustrated when people would say, oh, kids these days. And you just hear that, that phrase and it, it really grinds my gears when I hear people say that because they don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. like if you sat in on any class at Hopkins High School or any school around here, you would see some of the most high level learning. You'd see some very engaged students. You'd see some very ambitious students, but you'd also see kindness, compassion, uh, you'd see work ethic. You know, I have kids that come in really early in the morning, you know, for early meetings. Mm -hmm. They stay late. They say thank you on the way out of class. You know, I, they interact with foreign exchange students. They are always so kind and pleasant to kids that look different and, and sound different for them, you know. And yes, it's a high school setting. Kids are, you know, going to behave as children, but I'm, I'm so optimistic about uh, this next generation. They're very tenacious. They 
they're always looking to just tackle the next problem. They're not looking to wait their turn. They're not looking to ask for permission, you know, to go and fix something. They just do it and they engage with each other very well. I think maybe it's because our society is just like beating group work into students, mm -hmm. but I think it's paying off now. They work very cohesively together wow, and it's good. very, very impressive to see because I know that the problems that they're going to face, the problems we're all going to face, mm -hmm. they're going to require a group effort. They're going to require people to work together. And mm -hmm. I don't think there's a better generation to tackle some of these problems than this, this mm -hmm. next one that I've been teaching for a few years. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm very hopeful. Uh, I love being in the classroom every day. I've been surrounded by students that are far smarter than I ever will be. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, you know, kind of in the presence of greatness. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then there's other students who are just so kind and humble and I and then everybody in between and mm -hmm. so I really I really enjoy it I'm I'm hopeful for the future where so many people I think can be cynical mm -hmm. you know like oh we're we're doomed but I'm excited that's very encouraging to hear and mm -hmm. uh, we are so fortunate to have you as a teacher and a leader for this uh, new generation you speak of with such great hope and earnest uh, care mm -hmm. and uh, compassion and uh, insight and knowledge. So thank you for the good work you're doing. Enjoy the rest of your summer thank before you. you go back to school and then have a great next year awesome. over at Hopkinton High School. I thank appreciate you. it. Do you have what it takes? Make a difference. Always an adventure. Police and fire working together. Utilizing the latest technology. Do you have what it takes? <laughs>